Adams State College. Great stories begin here. Are you guys ready? Yeah. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started. The pizza is about gone up here, and our speakers are ready. So it looks like we have a great crowd. I don't know whether this is uh, trying to relax for the end of the semester or trying to ignore other things that we have to do for the end of the semester. Woo. In any case, we're happy to be all here. Is that an interesting topic? Or it's an interesting topic, yeah. Uh, a combination of all of the above. So I would like to announce that we do have one remaining talk, the one that was uh, postponed a couple weeks ago during the Student Scholar Days. Dr. hernandez Guzman will be giving a presentation next week at the same time, same place, uh, same pizza, probably. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Beaton and his two students, uh, Amy Scavizzi and Dan Carver, who will be presenting some of their work and research over the last year or two. So. Dr. Beaton. Okay, thank you for coming. I really appreciate the audience. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Jared Beaton. I'm an assistant professor of earth sciences here at Adams State College. So here's how this is going to work today. We're going to start broad, and I'm going to introduce this overall idea of our undergraduate research program. And then nested beneath that, we have these different projects that are going on. So the overall idea is to study glaciers, and to study rivers, and to study geoarchaeology. Uh, and these different projects have similar research questions. So we're going to start with these overriding research questions that really drive uh, these different research projects. So here's the first research question. How can soils and geomorphology be used to better understand river systems and glacial geology? This is Treasure Creek, and Treasure Creek is a tributary of the Alamos River which is a tributary uh, of the Rio Grande. So this is part of Dan's study area, and he'll be talking about these different localities. But the overall idea here, what we do is we go out in the fields, and we map landforms. And in mapping those landforms, we're creating spatial patterns. And then we find the ages of those landforms. And we do that using uh, soil chronologies, using soil data, uh, and also using carbon-14 dates. <coughs> so we're putting together the spatial and temporal patterns of landscape evolution. And by putting together the spatial and temporal patterns of landscape evolution, we can say something about how environments change over time, because landscapes are tied to the environment. <coughs> so that brings us to our second question, which is really, how do we use this data to say something about climate change and environmental change? So this is an image uh, not from Colorado. This is from Argentina. We don't have any glaciers like this in Colorado. We do have some kind of windy little perennial snowbanks that used to be glaciers. Uh, and by definition, they're a glacier because they show signs of, of past movement. Um, but we don't have anything like this. So here in Colorado, all we have are the deposits left behind. So what we do in Colorado is we go up and we, uh, we map the landforms. We find the ages of those landforms. And we start to piece together the story of glacial chronologies, when glaciers were advancing and when glaciers were receding. And that project, uh, that research question, will be, and I will focus on it a little bit more. So then the third research question. How can we use these data to start talking about human and environment interaction? And we're geographers, so we're always focused on human environment interactions. We study the environment, and then we're never too far from the culture. These are two images of buried in situ, meaning in place, cultural deposits. Uh, from a previous research project that I worked on in Kansas. And Dan's going to show some uh, that we've discovered here in Colorado and that we've mapped and submitted to uh, the Colorado State Historical Society. So the idea of getting at human environment, intera environment interactions is really geoarchaeology. And that's just using geological methods to assist in archaeological investigations. <coughs> so that brings us to the first project that's really nested beneath this undergraduate research program. And that first project is the one that Dan's going to be talking about. And it's Geoarchaeology of the Rio Grande Basin in Colorado. <clears throat> what we're really trying to do here, this is Dan out in the field in Hop Creek, and this is one of the study areas that he'll talk about, is we're trying to map where we find sediments of a given age. If we can map where we find sediments of a given age, and where those sediments are stored in the basin, then we can say something about where cultural deposits of a given period are more likely to be preserved. So it provides the archaeological community a map to go out and search for these different cultural remains. 
Without this, archaeologists uh, often don't know when they're digging how old the sediments are. If we're trying to put together an archaeological prediction model, this is sort of an end result of what that looks like. Uh, over here on the left, we have a GIS map that shows these different polygons. These different polygons really represent different terraces of the stream basin. And Dan will talk uh, in specific about these. But what this shows is that here's a T2 terrace, which is a higher terrace. And often there are older sediments stored beneath these higher terraces. And younger sediments stored beneath the, the lower terraces. So we go out and we map those landforms, find out where sediments of given ages are stored. And again, that provides the archaeological community with a map. So this map is tied to these data. And these data would show an archaeologist where you would find preserved cultural deposits, or where there are at least more likely to be in a basin. So the way this works, T0 is the lowest terrace going up to T2. Uh, this is Paleo-Indian deposits being the first or the earliest peoples in North America, going back to the ceramic. And this shows how high the potential would be to find those cultural deposits beneath any of these surfaces. So for example here, this is a larger valley. So this is the T2 surface mapped in red. And here we have a high potential for buried Paleo-Indian deposits, where we don't find that potential in any valleys of smaller streams. So this is an important map uh, for archaeologists to begin uh, a search for different age cultural deposits. So this research that Dan's going to talk about, uh, he's been working on this for about two years. He's presented this research at a regional meeting uh, of the Association of American Geographers in Utah, and also presented this research at a national meeting for the Geological Society of America uh, in Denver. <clears throat> so here's the second project. Uh, we're looking at glacial and periglacial deposits in several cirques in the Never Summer Mountains uh, in northern Colorado. And this is the project that Amy's been working on, and this is a collaborative effort between us and the University of Northern Colorado. So this is Amy out in the field, and this is Byron. He's a master's student at UNC, uh, a master's student in the earth sciences, and came out in the field with us last summer. So they're looking at this moraine out in the field, which is a glacial landform. And the overall idea of this uh, project is to map the spatial and temporal patterns of glacial chronology, of how glaciers were moving throughout this basin, <coughs> which tells us something about climate change. So I wanted to show this map before they get started. This is a map uh, that shows the two cirques that Amy will be talking about. And it's data that was put together before Amy even started on this research project. So here we have two cirques. These are glacial, uh, glacially carved valleys. And we have these different glacial landforms <coughs> in each of these cirques. So these were mapped before Amy really started on this project. And now what Amy's doing is continuing this research. Amy and Byron really, from the University of Northern Colorado. And they're looking in this area now. So this is down valley a little bit from the deposits that we've already mapped. So this is a really neat project because we can bring more students up here. There are lots of deposits to be mapped, uh, lots of deposits where we can try to find the ages of those deposits, and piece together the glacial story. So this is where I put in my plug for more students. Uh, those of you that are <laughs> science students and are interested in this kind of research, uh, is graduating this year. Dan's graduating next year. And we need more students to sort of take on these projects uh, and continue this research when they're ready. So with that introduction, I'm going to turn it over to Dan, and he's going to talk about the geoarchaeology of the Rio Grande Basin. Thank you. Well, uh, thanks again for coming out. A lot of uh, happy looking faces out there, so glad to see you all. Um, so yeah, I'm talking about the soils and geoarchaeology of Hot Creek, Lahar Creek, and the Alamosa River. Uh, these are all um, really cool places around the valley if you ever get a chance to see them. But if you're looking at this picture, hopefully you have a couple questions coming to mind. Um, namely, really, what am I looking at? Uh, if you asked me this question two years ago before I started, I probably would have said I found a cool rock in this pile of dirt. Um, things are a little bit different today. I've learned a lot. And um, now I can tell you that I'm looking at a soil, an unidentified soil. We haven't really characterized it yet. but. Um, as we get through this, I'm going to talk about really what is a soil and some really basic information that will help you understand myself and Amy's works. So uh, 
I'm going to be moving through it fast. If you have any questions, there's a lot of earth science students around, so you can ask them um, and hold the questions till the end. But to get started, we're going to look at what is a soil. So this is the textbook definition. It's really long and wordy, and you can read it if you like. Uh, I don't. It's a textbook definition. <laughs> so what I like to view them as is a structured interface between rock and life. Um, if you combine both of these and really look at what's required between these two definitions, so you can get a soil must con contain mineral and organic matter and structure. Uh, so let's look at two examples. This is a cut bank from north of town on the Rio. Uh, and then this is the uh, foothills of what I like to call Mount Alamosa. This is the big pile of stuff on the north end of campus. Um, <laughs> so if we're looking at both of these, they both contain mineral content. That's just dust, dirt, all those types of things. Um, organic material, you can see there's this darker band here, that's a lot of organic material, and then tree limbs, all that. Here, that's a big chunk of sod, so that's organic. Um, <coughs> the big difference is structure. This is structured, it's a straight face, so it has to be having something hold it up. Whereas this one is not, so this is not a soil, this is really a pile of dirt and other stuff. Um, so, with that said, we're gonna look at how soils form, how soils are described, and then also buried soils and their importance to our study here. So getting started with soil formation. Uh, the big thing, soils form from the top down. So depending on how deep they go, can give you a general idea of some age. Uh, this is just a picture showing um, a lot of times our soils out here on the river systems have these cobbles and then you know, the soil forming from the top down to those cobbles. And there's five factors that influence this soil formation um, and they're described by the acronym CLORT. So it's climate, organic material, relief, parent material, and time. Uh, within our study, we're really looking at changes in soil development over time, and this is what we call a chronosequence. So when we're describing these soils, um, there are some things we're looking for. Soils are composed of horizons. So these are um, really pretty visible changes in soil characteristics that we can pick up on based on these certain attributes that they have, their color, thickness, their structure, and their texture. Uh, so looking at these a little more closely, we can see we have an A horizon here. This is where you get a lot of organic material. That's where that dark color comes from. And then you typically get these kind of smaller structures called granular. They look like little pellets. Um, a B horizon, this is, um, it's a, you get more structure. So B horizons really tell you something about the age of the soil. You can get these really big, hard uh, clasped in these blocky or angular um, forms. And then sea horizon is what we consider the parent material. So this is what this soil has formed into, more or less, or formed from. So uh, with that, buried soils. Uh, buried soils, they represent a buried landscape. So soils are land surfaces, and now this is just a covered land surface. Uh, they're notated with this smaller B. So this is just a general horizon name with a smaller, the small letter pertaining to buried. And then they're important to geoarchaeology. And I'll get into that in just a second. But this is um, just a picture of a buried soil in the field before we've really cleaned it out. And then afterwards, after we've shoveled it and sh did all that. And you can really see this uh, buried A horizon. You can tell by that change in darkness there. That's that change in organic matter. So that's really what we're looking for when we're looking for these in the field. Okay, so we'll start a little story. Let's say this is an old environment. We'll call this a paleo landscape. So as you, um, at some time, there's people on these landscapes. And in this case, it's a group of uh, nomadic college students <laughs> moving along the landscape. So they're walking along a river, maybe looking for fish or something. and. Um, they end up stopping and having lunch. And when they eat, they probably leave something behind, be it you know, arrow flakes or maybe a bone or something from whatever they ate. And these are materials that we can identify these people from. Um, so what can happen with these buried landscapes is they leave this material on this surface. And then as the river floods, it deposits sediment on top of that material. So that basically preserves the material in that place. So that's what we mean by an in situ deposit. Um, so as this con river continues to deposit more and more sediment, eventually it'll stabilize and soil forms into that sediment from the top down, basically preserving this buried material. And what this might look like in the future, 
when um, scientists are out looking for it is something in the middle of this cut bank here that is just sticking out. It doesn't, I mean, that's not soil, it's a bone. Uh, we don't know if that's actually on a buried landscape or if it's something from the surface, but it's something we need to look into a uh, little more. But that's really, the cool thing about it is, is that's how it was left there. And that's what's great about these buried surfaces. They really um, protect how well, or protect how it was deposited. So uh, again, start with some research goals. We're, through our project, we're basically identifying and describing sediments and soils and landforms. Uh, we do this by describing a small section of soil in great detail, and we use that to describe the whole soil on that landform. Um, from that, we can look at how that landform relates to other landforms in the landscape. And by doing that, we're modeling the temporal and spatial patterns of landscape evolution using these soil stratigraphic relationships. So in the end goal of this project is, uh, like Dr. Beaton said, is to work towards this predictive model, a way to locate cultural deposits based on what sediment package they're in. So this is, yeah, this is a better part. We get pictures finally. Um, <laughs> Geographic setting, this is almost all in Conejos County. Uh, we're on the three rivers, Alamos River, Hot Creek, and Lahara Creek. We have five different localities that we've worked at over the years, and um, the lower Alamosa and lower Hot Creek localities, we're not gonna touch on very much. They're kind of uh, old news, I guess. <laughs> and for, through this talk, we're gonna look at Treasure Creek. This is our upper site on the Alamosa River. Uh, our upper locality at Lahara Creek, and then Hot Creek. Hot Creek we've expanded a lot this past summer. So getting started, Treasure Creek, uh, definitely the nicest looking spot that we work at. Um, it's really cool. It's a tributary of the Alamosa River and it's a first order stream, meaning it's small. Uh, this is the smallest stream we look at within this study. And we looked at it mainly to try to find some possible correlations to glaciers. We weren't very successful with that, but it happens. Um, and we described one soil at this locality. So this is how I've chosen to represent all the data we've collected for, from all these soils. Uh, the important thing to look at is these columns here. These represent the depths of the soil with the bottom being water table. So you can get an idea of the size of this package of sediment. Um, the soil that we found was an ABW. That W, that's this T1 here. The BW stands for weakly developed. So that means that it hasn't had a long time to form. So it's a younger soil than let's say this one over here with this really nice B horizon. Um, all this information here, this is laboratory test just kind of put very concisely in a chart. But don't worry about that. It's not too important for what we're looking at today. Uh, Lahara Creek. So Lahara Creek, we looked at this above and below the reservoir. Uh, Lahara Reservoir is way up there. Um, it's a second order stream, so it's a little bit larger than our, um, the Treasure Creek that we just saw. And we described one soil, and then we noted this other high soil. This is a, just a larger landform on the landscape. It's from the title shot, too. We didn't describe it because you'd have to dig back in about five feet into, you know, maybe six feet thick of sediment. So that's a long day. Um, <laughs> and the big thing we got from Lahara Creek is there's limited terrace development on the southern side of the reservoir. Uh, this soon goes into Lahara Canyon and gets really confined. So we're kind of assuming that there's not much sediment storage between the reservoir and our lower locality. So at this point, we have Lahara Creek pretty well um, mapped out. And the results from this, this is a bit of a bigger site. We have eight soils described. The one we found um, at the upper locality, LJ1, is, it has a BT profile. So the T stands for clay pickup. And again, this is something that happens over time, so it just tells you about, a little bit about the age of the landform. So this is older than the landform we found at um, Treasure Creek. We can't say that definitely, but it appears to be. So moving on to Hot Creek, uh, this is really the cool spot in my opinion. I like it a lot. This is a, a beaver stick that I thought looked like a trophy, and I wanted to put it in there. But... Uh, <laughs> So we're really going over some developments since 2010. Uh, we expanded the area quite a bit. And then we also found this cool concept of geomorphic controls. That's really, uh, we're gonna get to in some detail. Clicker doesn't like it over here. And then we have four newly described soils. Um, we'll go over those in detail again. And then the biggest thing is this continuous buried A, buried B profile. Uh, that represents a continuous landscape at one time. 
and an archaeological site, which Dr. Beaton mentioned, that burned earth feature. So Hawk Creek. Uh, this is the work from 2009, uh, everything we had mapped out. And then just to kind of represent what we've done since then, um, we've really just expanded into this area here, but there's four different soils in that small area. So we're going to be looking at this spot in greater detail. Um, this area down here is something we just walked through, and hopefully we'll get a chance to kind of describe better coming up. And... Cool. Okay, so looking at that in just greater detail, this map's going to stick with us for the next couple of slides, so just to kind of get a better idea, these polygons represent different landforms on the landscape. So, Hot Creek, like I said, we've had four described soils. Um, these are basically all these, what these polygons pertain to. Uh, HC1 is a T1 terrace, that's a lower terrace. HC2, another T1 terrace. HC3, it's a higher terrace, which we'll talk about in some detail coming up. And then HC4 um, is just another T1 terrace. So taking that and looking at these results, the biggest thing that we found at Hawk Creek is this continuous buried A profile. And so like I've said before, this really represents at one time, this entire study area had one land surface. So it's all uniform across the whole extent of our research in Hot Creek so far. So with taking that, um, we're going to look at this HC3, this T2, or this T2 profile, which kind of, it's kind of an anomaly on this landscape, and we really had to explain that. So the way we did that is looking at some geomorphic controls. Um, this is just our map, and now this is a satellite view. I think it shows it a little bit clearer of what this landscape looks like. And the big thing we found were these two constrictions. Uh, these were basically places on the stream within this valley where it got really small. So the stream could have been easily blocked at either one of these points at some time. Um, and what that did was create this package of sediment in between here that's much higher than any other place on the landscape. So the idea being at this lower spot here, you could have had a deaver dam that off and all these streams through here, these are ephemeral streams, so they only run part of the year, basically could be dumping sediments into this area that's confined by these two constrictions and piling up lots and lots of sediments in between these two landforms. Um, so what that does is create this unique uh, T2 terrace, this high terrace, um, the HC3. So this is a picture of the terrace. Uh, it's got a more complex profile. The important thing to look at here, this BK, the K stands for calcium carbonate pickup. So that means that you have more, uh, that's something that again accumulates through time. So it's, it tells you that this is a little bit of an older profile. So looking at these kind of generally, uh, the A is right on the top, this B is probably in through here. The buried A starts about right there and then there's that buried B underwater. I, I just think that's really cool. You really don't see that very often. Um, so the big thing to focus your attention on is this burned earth feature, and this is what our archaeological site is. Uh, a burned earth is basically a localized um, alteration of the soil that's caused by, based on the extent of how far this reaches, it's only about this big. So really small, really localized, and we attribute that to a campfire at some point. Um, the big part about this feature is it forms right on top of this buried A profile. So that means this continuous land surface throughout Hot Creek had people on it at some time. So this is, I mean, this is evidence that people were here. And the fact that it's right on top of this B, um, that's how we know that. And this is old enough that you can have, uh, people had a fire at this point here, and then 75 centimeters of sediment was deposited on top of that. And then that soil developed from the top down all the way to this buried land feature again. So we don't know how long exactly, um, but it's, I'm guessing, a pretty substantial thousands of years. Um, and the great thing is, too, we recently got some funding from the Porter uh, Fund for carbon-14 dating. So we do have material collected just from pretty much right there um, that was recently sent off for dating. So we are going to have a numerical date for uh, this, not only the buried landscape, but also this archaeological site. So that's really pretty exciting. It's coming in weeks. It takes them a long time. Uh, so 
kind of wrap everything up here, uh, this is really getting back to the idea of this predictive <laughs> model for locating culture deposits. Um, the big thing that we're, I mean, right now we're really looking at all these, these cut banks, these kind of like windows to the subsurface. They really expose that ground very well. Uh, they all have that continuous landscape. We're going to have an age for that landscape. So then we're going to be able to say the minimum age of all of this material, which is basically at one time was the surface of this entire landscape here. It's a pretty large area, at least for, um, from my perspective. And um, with that, we're going to be able to say that, you know, if you're looking for objects of X years or older, you might be able to find it here. So it's a, it's a big step from moving from just the, the qualitative, this is a little bit older, to having that numerical date, being able to say with definity how old this landscape is. So uh, in the future, I think the most exciting part is uh, Gary Potter. This is him right here. He's coming on to the project. He's going to start doing um, his own little twist on it, whatever he'd like to do. And um, both him and I are uh, Porter Scholars, so we received that funding for Carbon-14 dating. And we're going to try to get material, <coughs> organic material dated from all these valleys to get really good ideas how old these landforms are. And senior capstone next year, this will be my senior capstone project, so putting it into a paper form and really getting everything kind of put together a little more neatly than it is now. <laughs> <coughs> the reason I'll show this picture um, this is something that Gary actually found. We, this pile of rocks right here, we believe it to be a hunting blind. Um, what that is, is basically people could have hid right behind here, and it's right at those constrictions we talked about, it's right at that lower constriction on Hot Creek. So it's probably only 10 meters wide at that point compared to you know, 40 or 50 meters up, up through here. So if people could drive down game past this point, you get them in a really small spot. Um, and the reason we think this is old is there's actually, uh, you can see there's lichen growing on these rocks, but we believe that lichen, um, or we actually observed it, it's growing from one rock to another, meaning that ro those rocks were there long enough for this lichen to basically bridge that gap. And it just represents stability. There's no way of really getting a definitive date on it, but it tells us that it's old, <laughs> whatever that means. You know. <laughs> Uh, and then some of you may have heard there was a mammoth found in the valley. Uh, this is currently an archaeological site being ran by some people from the Natural Science Museum in Denver and the BLM. And Dr. Beaton got invited along to be a part of this project. And Gary and I were lucky enough to come along as well. So I just threw on a couple pictures. This is uh, the mammoth skull. It's really fragmented. There's a lot of um, just little pieces of skull and uh, tusk bones scattered all throughout here. And then also, this is a little camel leg bone, I think. And then this little tiny piece is the one I found. I'm pretty proud of it. Um, <laughs> I know it's not as impressive, but I like it a lot. So uh, with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Amy. Uh, we'll have questions at the end of Amy's talk. And she's got an awesome presentation, too. So hope you all enjoy it. I'm Amy, and I'm going to be talking about how, I, how I'm using soil analysis to construct, to reconstruct the glacial chronology of Snow Lake Sur in the Never Summer Mountains of Colorado. So just kind of an introduction and to get you familiar with what we're going to be talking about. A glacial chronology is what I'm trying to make based on the idea that there's times when glaciers are advancing and receding, and each time they advance and come back, they're depositing different landforms and changing the landscape. And so I'm trying to identify relative ages within my area to see maybe this one was deposited at an older glaciation, maybe they were deposited at the same time, just kind of form that glacial chronology. And to do that, I'm using what's called a pedochronology, pedo meaning soil. And the cool thing about soils is that they record their own history. They have certain properties and characteristics you can observe over time that tells you what's going on and how, they, how long they've been forming. So I'm taking samples from three, landscape, or three landforms in my CERC 
doing a pedochronology on them, using that to create a glacial chrono chronology. So that makes my research question, what are the relative ages of the glacial landforms in Snow Lake Cirque? But before we dig into that, let's talk about glacial <coughs> landforms for a second. This is a picture of Snow Lake Cirque. And like Dr. Beaton said, a cirque is just sort of a valley that's been carved out by the glacier. It's where the glacier begins and ends. And uh, yeah, this is Snow Lake Cirque. It's real pretty. This is a moraine, or this is a moraine and this is a moraine. Moraines are deposits, um, mound-shaped deposits from glaciers. When they're receding or melting, they're going uphill and sometimes they'll stop for a while. And when they stop long enough, um, material will flow out of them and kind of build up around the edges and in front of them. And so that's what we have here. This is called a lateral moraine where material has been deposited along the side of a glacier. And this is called an end moraine where material has been deposited right in front of the glacier where it stopped for a while. This is my geographic setting. We're in north central Colorado. These little yellow dots are my sample sites. So I took a sample on what I'm calling the north moraine, the unknown landform, and the south moraine. And that's the three landforms I'll be comparing. The, this is that cirque that I showed you in that first picture. And the next picture you're going to see will be me standing right here looking down valley at these landforms. So that's what we'll look at next. So here I am looking down valley on that end moraine. This is that north moraine. Here's my unknown landform and my south moraine over here. And if you look at this, you can sort of imagine how a glacier might have been in this valley and it probably would have been the edges of it right about here, maybe stopped there for a while and the other edge right here. So you can kind of see where the glacier might have been. And that's what chose me, that's what led me to choose these landforms as my forms to test was trying to imagine how the glacier was at the time that these were formed. So here's another picture of my North Moraine. This is that picture from before. I'm standing down here now looking up valley at the North Moraine. And we took samples on this side of the Moraine, down on the back side there. And um, here's that other picture. This is the South Moraine here. And up here is that South Moraine. This is the top picture is me standing on the North Moraine taking a picture of the South Moraine. And it, here's our unknown landform. And this is it closer up. This is actually a person <coughs> right there is a hiker. So it's a pretty big landform. Um, and this is me stand, the top picture is me standing on the North Marine looking at that um, unknown landform. So my hypothesis is that the North and South Moraines were deposited at approximately the same time and that the unknown landform is the youngest landform. And I should be able to test this based on soil development because they're all glacial landforms, at least I'm assuming that unknown landform was deposited by a glacier. So the methods I used to test this hypothesis were soil analyses. I did research on other local glaciations and, and other local chrono, uh, chronologies that have already been completed. And then I also did research on glacial, glacial geomorphology, so how glacial landscapes change over time. What I did was on each landform, I took a catena of samples. And that means that I took a sample at the <coughs> summit, back slope, and toe slope of each landform. I didn't actually t sample the toe slope of the unknown landform because it had water around it and I couldn't get to the toe slope. But I took the summit, back slope, toe slope of both the moraines and the summit and back slope of the unknown landform. And at each sample site, so I dug a hole at the summit, went down, and found horizons of soil. So there's going to be several horizons of soil at each so sample site for each landform. So it used to be a lot of soil. It's like 37 samples. Um, this is a picture of me taking, digging a hole on that north moraine at the back slope. This is our summit dig up here, back slope, and then the toe slope will be down here. So the soil analyses that I conducted were organic carbon content. Generally, as the soil ages, it will increase in organic carbon content. It can also be influenced by factors other than time, but that's one of our age indicators. Color, um, the alpine soils that I'm looking at tend to get redder over time. So a redder soil is usually an oil, older soil. And then structure, like Dan had said, as soils develop, they form a structure. And so the type of structure it has and the strength of that structure can also indicate age. Clay content. As soils form, the weathering processes that form them continue, and so 
particles are constantly getting finer and finer. So the more clay you have in it, the longer it's been weathering and the older it is. And then the thickness of the B horizons. A horizons will generally hit kind of an average thickness for an area and then level <coughs> off. And B horizons will continue to get thicker over time. So these are all the things I'm looking at and comparing on each of the landforms to see which one's older and which one's younger. These are graphs I made that show the thickness of each horizon the, and the clay and organic carbon content of each horizon. So here you can see the thickness and depth is on this side. Um, and you can see the A horizon here, for example, is about 11 or 12 centimeters thick. And then the B horizon is maybe 5 or 6. And then this, the C horizon goes all the way down. So these are, things to, these are the things I'm trying to show. I didn't dig to any specific depth. I was trying to get down into the sea horizons, which is the parent material, the, the sediments or rocks or whatever it is that the soil's forming from. But on the south moraine, I had such clayey soils that it was really hard to dig in them, and I was going to be out there for days. So I got to uh, sea horizon on the north moraine a couple times, and then on the south moraine, no sea horizons. But what I want to show is a general trend. Two general trends you'll see on these is that the North Moraine will tend to have more organic carbon content throughout its horizons, and the South Moraine has more clay content all the way through all of the profiles. And so you can see that the T, like Dan said, is a pickup of clay. So the BT signifying that there's significantly more clay in that horizon than the previous one, and the BT2 here. This, and then we can compare these to the summit dig on the unknown landform. You can see this peak in clay here <coughs> on that one, and then a pretty low amount of carb organic carbon content. We can look at this. The clay starts at 15, goes to about 25, and comes back to about 13 here. And when we compare that to the other two, it has more clay content than the north moraine, and uh, starts off similar to the south moraine, but the south moraine has, about twi has significantly more clay in it. And then we can look at these graphs again. Oh, also looking at thicknesses of horizons, the B horizon on this one is thicker than the B horizon here. But then it goes down to a BC, which is a parent material that's starting to form into soil and starting to show some structure and other soil properties. So not quite full on soil yet. And uh, this one goes from a B to another B, a BTK, which is clay and calcium carbonate pickup. Um, so. We're looking at all these things. And then we can also look at the backslope of the unknown landform. And it has pretty low clay content, pretty low organic carbon content. And it goes from an A to a B, C. So straight into the uh, slightly developed soil and then parent material. And here we are on the toe slopes. Again, we're looking at um, more clay content on the south moraine, more organic carbon content on the north moraine, thicker B horizons on the south moraine, and more B horizons on the South Moraine, where the North Moraine goes from a BWJ, which is a weakly developed juvenile soil, into a parent material, an oxidized C horizon. And then structure was the other thing I looked at. And structure gets a lot more detailed than this, but this is just sort of the surface to look, source, like the main things to look at in structure. And what you kind of see here is that the North Moraine and South Moraine tend to have similar structures throughout their profiles. And the unknown landform it has a granular structure all the way down. So from least developed to most developed, it goes granular, subangular blocky, angular blocky. Um, and the unknown landform is completely granular all the, down, all the way through its profiles. And the north and south moraines have kind of a mix of granular and subangular blocky horizons. Same thing on this page. This is the only horizon that had angular blocky structure, which would indicate a little bit more time developing and structure building there. The unknown landform, again, has only granular structure all the way down, and then a mix on the two moraines. And then here we are on the toe slope. Again, pretty similar structures. So soil color is another thing. Like I said, soils in the alpine soils, they tend to get redder as they age. And so what you can look at here is 7.5, 7.5 YR means less red, and 10 YR means more red. And those are the only two colors we have on these. So if you look at the North Moraine, there's a pretty good mix of 7.5 YR and 10 YR. 
The south moraine only has one horizon <coughs> that's 7.5 YR. And then the unknown landform is again pretty well mixed between 10 YR and 7.5 YR. So we have redder soils overall on the south moraine than on any, three land, on any of the three landforms. The other thing I want you to note here is that all of these landforms go from an A to a B. And even though we don't see C horizons on these because I didn't dig to them, there is something below the B horizon that the soil is forming from. So every soil has a C horizon. So all of these landforms, all of the soils are A, B, C profiles, which is really significant because there's been data done. Well, we'll just show you this. Um, data has been done on other landforms that are glacial landforms in the front range. And moraines from the Satanta Peak Advance and the Triple Lakes Advance all have A, B, C profiles. And younger glaciations, the moraines and landforms from those glaciations only go from A, C or have no soil formation yet. So what this is, is a timeline of glaciations during the late Pleistocene and the Holocene. Those are the epochs that we're in, in the geologic timeline. And um, our soils match up pretty well with the Satanta Peak moraine soils and Triple Lakes advanced soils. So it's pretty safe to say that my soils are at least 3,000 years old. We're deposit, we're started forming at least 3,000 years ago because soils from the Audubon Advance and Arapaho Peak Advance are showing no development or very, very little development. So in conclusion, my soils data suggests that the South Moraine may be older than the North Moraine. It had more clay content all the way through. It had redder soils, had similar structure. It was uh, lower in organic matter, but across the board it looks like it might be a little bit older. The unknown landform looks like the youngest of the three, assuming it's similar material that it's forming from. And then the north and south moraines were deposited no sooner than 3,000 years ago. <coughs> My discussion thoughts are that it would be really good to get down to the till. That's what, it's, what the glacial deposit material is called when it comes straight from the glacier. So I think it would be really good to get down to the till material on the south moraine, because we only hit it on the north moraine, those sea horizons. Um, to see the full depth of the soil profile, see how many B horizons there are. And also looking for LUS, which is just windblown silt. And it's very common after glaciers deposit landforms that l silt will be blown and kind of blanketed onto those landforms. And soil can form from silt also, which would affect the rate of soil formation. And then I really want to know what the unknown landform is. And the final question, which is kind of that whole research question, in a bigger picture is when was each landform deposited or eroded. So thank you guys for listening and we can take questions. <laughs>
larger or smaller, but it's just typically the larger order stream, uh, the, <coughs> the larger the order of the stream, the more water it has in it because it has more turbulence. Yes, Mark. <laughs> um, this is Amy, and uh, like, what are the what are the chances of your unknown landform being a uh, like another terminal moraine, but just based off the, the red blue content, as far as H goes? I mean, it was the yeah. youngest out of, out of the three, right? It looks like it's the youngest out of the three. Yeah. So. I haven't even thought about it as a terminal moraine. It seems like a, it seems like more of something that was maybe deposited as the glacier melted. But have you thought of it as a terminal moraine? <coughs> it's not really in a good landscape position to be a terminal moraine. But we do have some other ideas of what it might be. Yeah. So this is actually our unknown landform right here that I took a picture of from the South Moraine. And uh, this is called a drumlin. This is one of the things we think it might be. The, for, the way that drumlins form is pretty well debated, but they tend to form in groups, and our unknown landform is the only one up there, so that's just one of our thoughts. Another thought is that it's a pingo, which forms in a paraglacial environment, which is almost glacial, really cold, but not cold enough, and it forms by the heaving of ice layers freezing and then collapsing. And then our last thought, which was actually Dr. Benson's thought, was that it might be a came, which is this landform right here, which is where sediments will kind of flow and pile up, and then the ice will melt and drop it all. So those are the thoughts that we've had about what that might be. So far, we haven't really been very conclusive about it. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Dr. Aldridge? I was chatting with a friend the other day about hiking on the dunes, and I jokingly, I jokingly referred to climbing on a big pile of dirt. And she just said, no, it's not dirt. That's sediment. And I was like, whoa, OK. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> and I know this man was making a distinction between dirt and soil. Could you talk about the differences between those things? Somebody, anybody? I, um, really so that one slide I had, the soil is really pretty distinct. Term. I don't have a good definition for dirt. I call a lot of things dirt. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't call, since the sand dunes are such a uniform particle size, you can call them sand. <laughs> <laughs> well, the sand dunes are definitely sediment because they were yeah, deposited yeah. by wind. So, but yeah, they're sand. <laughs> Steve, soil requires stability. So you have to have stability on the landscape for a long period of time for a soil to develop, and it has structure and it has those horizons in it. Dirt, sediment, and structure. Any other questions? Adams State College, great stories begin here.